Okay, let's get started. So welcome to another episode of the Silk and Steel podcast. I'm your host, Carl Zha. And today we have a very special guest all the way from China. Uh, welcome to our show, Mr. Gordon Gao. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you on your uh, podcast. Uh, I, I remember we have been talking about this for at least half a year. So finally, it's, uh, it's come true. And, uh, yeah, I especially like your podcast program because I think you're among the few ones who take Xinjiang issue and take uh, the Central Asia history seriously. I actually enjoy uh, some of your podcast, uh, you know, taking some uh, very close look at Xinjiang's uh, history. I think there's a uh, few ones seriously studying that. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a pleasure to be uh, on your sh on your podcast program and uh, to talk about my experience, my personal experience as a minority ethnic guy grew up in Xinjiang. So uh, I think before we come to our formal topic, I need to uh, make a few disclaimers. First, uh, uh, the things I'm talking about are strictly myself, my personal experience. I'm not trying to generalize uh, my experience to all the people in Xinjiang. There are 25 million folks back home. So I'm going to speak for myself. But I think that for any uh, well-educated people, uh, they can basically, uh, when they listen to my stories as a uh, minority ethnic guy, Mongolian, minority ethnic, uh, minority ethnic guy growing up in Xinjiang, the things I heard, the things I saw, and the things I experienced, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good for themselves to make their own conclusions based on those informations. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's. I think that's the things I need to see. Uh, that, that's um, so. Maybe let me introduce you a little further. <laughs> so, I I met you on Twitter, and immediately I realized you have a very interesting perspective on Xinjiang in particular, because you yourself uh, grew up as an ethnic minority, uh, uh, ethnic Mongol in Xinjiang. And, and right now, as you know, Xinjiang is in the news and, and there's a lot of disinformation about Xinjiang, especially in the Western uh, mainstream media. And I thought it was great to invite you to my show to talk about your own personal experience growing up in Xinjiang as a ethnic minority. Uh, I mean, because right now we hear people, you know, like white expat uh, <laughs> and white anthropology professors mm -hmm. at George Washington University talking about Xinjiang, but we, we don't hear too many of like the native Xinjiang voice. So, so thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview. And um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe you can introduce a little bit about um, yourself like if you don't mind you know you, you can talk about your personal experience growing up in Xinjiang uh back in what uh 80s 90s 2000 uh <laughs> because um, out. <laughs> yeah 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 well, whatever you want to talk about I mean it's 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 uh it's free well it's, it's gonna be like a uh, it'll be like conversation between you and me right yeah sure 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 yeah uh, very good. So I'm trying to uh, make it very uh, as interesting as possible because I have a tough day today. You know, so don't worry. Out. Your 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 story will be interesting because you know we we don't know. It, it, my most of my uh, audience are English speaking uh, uh, audience from primarily United States, but other English countries, uh, speaking country as well, like Australia, Canada, UK, etc. There's such so little information about Xinjiang, you know, so I say any information is good. <laughs> any information good. is good for myth for disinformation. So so you know, whatever you have to say, I'm sure it's, it's quite valuable input. I start to introduce myself a little bit. So I was uh, born in Xinjiang uh, at the capital Romchi, and I'm half Mongolian, half Han, half Mongolian on my mother's side and half Han on my father's side. Uh, this mixed family is not uncommon back in Xinjiang, especially in the northern part of Xinjiang. So um, I was, well, after I was born, I was registered as a Mongolian, which everyone agrees, uh, because at, um, you know why actually? Because there, there's actually, uh, benefits to ethnic groups, uh, ethnic minority guys. Uh, in 
Oh, there's a internet issue for our case. Yeah, to be uh, to be Mongolian, you know, to be able to take advantage of the, the ethnic minority policies in China. And but first of all, the existence, as I mentioned, with Dan, the existence of myself is the result of China's ethnic minority policy. Because in, uh, I was born in 80, uh, 86. So uh, back to the, uh, I think throughout the 80s and most of the times in the 90s, uh, that was the time that China's uh, single one-child uh, one policy was the strictest. So uh, that means that if you are Han Fan Lei and if you are, uh, you know, uh, give birth to one, more than one child, uh, that would be disastrous for your family. If you're working for a publicly owned company or something, a state-owned company or a government or a military, uh, you'll be fine immediately. So uh, lucky thing is that- uh, So uh, let me interject for a second, because yeah, I am 10 yeah, years yeah. older than you. So I, I okay, also okay. have a personal anecdotal story about the one child yeah. policy, because I was- okay, yeah, I was born in 1976. Uh, the, the time I was born, China just started yeah, right. one child policy and it was kind of yeah. rolled out in different regions, different cities. Mm -hmm. And at that time, my my mom was from Chongqing. Chongqing is where oh, okay. I was born. And yeah. uh, in, but she and her, my dad, they both work in the Tibetan area of Sichuan because they were sent down during cultural revolution as part of the uh, educated youth. Uh, my dad yeah. was an engineer and my mom was a nurse. And right. the policy back then was in, in big cities like Chongqing, the Han, uh, Han families can only have one child. It's one child yeah. policy. But yeah. uh, that back then, the, the, the one child policy didn't apply to ethnic uh, minority regions yet. Yeah. You know, it didn't apply to the different because, areas. Yeah. Uh, and also for the, for the, the those, Han people that was, were sent to the frontier region, that were sent to like ethnic minority uh, areas, like during Cultural Revolution, like my parents, they were allowed to have two yeah. kids. They were allowed to have oh, two yeah, kids. Yeah. So I was legal. I was <laughs> I was legally born, but but yeah, my yeah. my uh, huko or my resident permit will be tied uh -huh. to the Tibetan area. So my 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 resident permit was would be. Uh, tied to Kangding uh, in uh, Gansu, Gansu uh, Tibetan okay. Autonomous okay. Prefecture. Uh, but okay. my, even though my mom came back to Chongqing to give birth to me, uh, and, and she actually ran into problems because uh, the first hospital she went to, they were like a model, uh, they were like model hospital for implementing uh, one child policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the hospital director is like, no, 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 we can't take you. You know, like if you take you, that's gonna break our record of implementing that one child policy. My mom's like, but yeah. wait, wait, wait. You know, the policy said uh, because I work in the Tibetan areas, I'm allowed yeah, to have two yeah. two children. And yeah. the director said, what do you mean? That's not Gansu is not part of China. <laughs> because she, she didn't understand the the one child policy is different like across regions so my mom has actually had to go to a second hospital in order to give birth to me and then uh, my grandma had to pull a lot of personal connections in order to change my uh, resident permit from Gansu Tibetan Autonomous mm -hmm. Prefecture to yes. Chongqing, where I was born. So that, but in 1976, uh, so I was born in 1976. I went to uh, elementary school in 1982. And I remember my class, I was only one with, with a sibling. I only, me have an older sister, the rest of them all. Awesome here. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so, so okay, yeah, so yeah. back to you, <laughs> back to your story. Right, right. Oh, interesting story. I, I really enjoy that. And I also realized that the one child policy is, uh, is applied differently across regions and to different groups of people. For example, your uh, mother was uh, uh, one of the Jibian Qingyan or Jibian Ganbu. So uh, because he uh, actually suffered a lot working far away from home in those frontier areas with harsh conditions. So special policy applies to them as well. So uh, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's very good to know because uh, for my family, only because my mom uh, is Mongolian ethnicity, 
So uh, the special policy of uh, allowing two child applied to applying to our family. I mean, I'm only talking about the urban area applied to the back to the because in the rural area, obviously, uh, the ethnic minority people can have more than two ch children. Uh, for example, uh, as we know, the rural people in Nanjiang, the southern part of China, always have you know five or six uh, children or uh, something. Many uh, very big family. So yeah, I remember. I remember the. I think the policy was uh, kind of changed from year to year. It was two yeah, for yeah. the urban families and three for the rural families. But in Xinjiang, it's not really enforced, <laughs> especially in rural areas. Oh, yeah. uh, like like that's Actually, why. The that's why yeah, like the, the chairman of uh, chairwoman of the uh, Uyghur World Congress, uh, Ru uh, uh, Rubia Kadir, right? She has like five kids. She has five kids, right? <laughs> so obviously the one child policy didn't apply to her. I mean, or, or oh. most of the Uyghur families didn't get affected. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very good point. I mean, back to the 80s and 90s, especially in the rural area, nobody cares that. And no one seriously applied the one child policy to the rural area because the uh, you know the social what I say the social governance system of China is mainly through Danwei, the units, or through the personnel relationship, formal personnel personnel relationship, because only in that way you can punish and incentive people to do certain things. If you're just a, a farmer in the rural area and no obvious governance connections with you. you can, basically do whatever you want that to say. So, yeah, so for, uh, sorry to interrupt you one more time. So for, for my audience who may not understand 1980s China, yeah. uh, 1980s China is still very much a uh, mm. very socialist planned economy, yeah. especially yeah. in the cities, yeah. right? I mean, the when you, when you graduate yeah. from college or from, you, when you graduate from college, you are assigned a government job. You, yeah, you know, yeah. like everything is kind of planned for and assigned. So, so okay, like you, yeah. your that tang way or your work unit is everything. You, you, so you kind of exactly. have to comply. Your social security, your medical care, uh, your children go to schools. They take care of everything. So that was the old socialist the way of doing things of uh, social governance back to that time. So for the people who live in the urban area and work for the publicly owned units or state owned mm -hmm. units. Uh, you know, abide by the one-child policy is very important. It's probably one of the, the most important things. So okay. yeah, that's the background. Yeah. If I may so, ask, uh, yeah. um, if I may ask, yeah. can you yeah. can you can you tell like uh, if you if you are willing to share, how did your parents meet? You know, you you mentioned your dad is Han and your mom is Mongol. Ah, cultural revolution. <laughs> same, same, similar with your parents needs. So my, both of them need to travel very far uh, from their home that they meet in Turpan. Uh, you know, one of uh, the, the city famous for its grapes uh, in the southern part of Xinjiang, but in the, right on the, uh, I think, border of uh, southern part of southern Xinjiang, northern Xinjiang. So it's, it's more, it's like to the eastern, uh, eastern part of Xinjiang. Eastern, Turpan, yeah. Turpan right. depression. Yeah. It, it's still kind of, kind of, some people consider it southern Xinjiang because south of the Tianshan Mountains, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. So is that where that's your dad it, is from? Uh, you're right. you're, sorry. Is that where your dad? Did you say that's where your dad is from, or where your mom is? No, from? no, no. My daddy was uh, was enlisted uh, when he was seventeen to join the PLA and sent to Xinjiang. Ah. <laughs> he he didn't know where he was going. Because back to the early sixties, mm -hmm. um, you know, there was. Uh, uh, Kind of a uh, very bad situation in rural area, mainly because the uh, starvations, uh, the food problems. So uh, you do everything to get out of the rural area right, to the urban area. And, yeah, that, that uh, was one of the know. major way yeah. of migration to Xinjiang. In the it was in the 1960s, around the famine, right? The famine year eras, yeah. Yeah. So so back to that time, uh, three main ways to uh, get out the get out of the rural area and uh, to go to uh, you know, better places, the urban area where is food is allocated to you in the socially planned uh, economy. Uh, so one of the ways is uh, to join the army and to be enlisted and to send to other parts of China. And the second way is to become a, a worker, work for the public on the factories, uh, which is uh, as we say. 
and uh, there's some other weights, but uh, there's two major weights. So my father managed to get the first weight to be enlisted, and uh, and he didn't know where he was sent in practice. And when uh, I, I remember that he told me that after about three or four days in the in the train with our windows, you know, the factories and the train was full, the cargo train, and uh, we have of course we got food and we got to uh, you know. Uh, Get get off the train. Get off the train uh, from time to time. After about three or four days, it's found that there's no trees outside. It's only sands, you know, uh, just a desert, you know. <laughs> and he was crying back to that time because he wasn't know he was where he was going. Uh, where was he originally back, from? Where was your dad originally from? Uh, it's a, it's a it's a it's a, on the border of Shandong and Henan Province. It's called Shangshu. Ah, okay. So it's very yeah, heartland of heartland yeah. of central plains in northern China. Yeah. Yeah, in the central parts of China. So uh, when he, he was enlisted, when he was seventeen, but uh, in order to get uh, you know join the army and get out of the rural area to the urban area, he uh, he reports his uh, age was eighteen. So only in that way can be enlisted. So uh, after uh, serving in the army for. Uh, Few years, and he was transferred uh, for, for some years. He was transferred uh, uh, to the uh, local government system as he works for the uh, Transportation and Highway Management Bureau of Xinjiang for many, many years until he retired. Uh, so uh, that's one of the most important ways that how I know Xinjiang geographically because uh, I remember that from my uh, primary school, high school. Uh, in every summer vacation, he would take me to one of his tours, inspection tours, because he needs to inspect the road construction in Xinjiang. It's very important because Xinjiang is so vast, and the train a railway line in Xinjiang was, was very few back to that. So the whole transportation system was mainly road transportation. And the Xinjiang's geographic conditions are very harsh. We have desert. Uh, we have high mountains with snow, so in spring that we flood, uh, there, there are flood, and in the summer it's very dry, so the road is very easy to be uh, you know, destroyed by the powers of nature. So he has to uh, you know, drive around with his colleagues and inspect the road transportation system. Yeah, I remember I remember back when I was growing up in China, I think the train only go up to Urumqi, right? Only goes up to the capital. Uh, I think this yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, um, in 1980s, I, mean, I, 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 I think no, 1980s. I think later they made the train to to the Kazakhstan yeah, yeah. border, and then then much uh, later yeah. they, they built the train to Kashgar. But my, in my memory, yeah. like back back in early 80s, I think the train only goes to Urumqi and a little bit. And that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also western world from Urumqi to uh, from Chilapu. Which is on the border of uh, Xinjiang and I uh, remember the uh, Kyrgyzstan, and from that time, that's the Oya Dalu the intercontinental bridge between uh, uh, Asia and Europe, from all the way to uh, to Western Europe. So I, I think that was completed in the early nineteen uh, nineties, uh, just after the collapse of Soviet Union. Yeah. So yeah, but uh, back to then, the road transportation was mean uh, transportation. Means. So. Uh, I'm so yeah, yeah. I, I'm just I'm still curious. Like, did your dad meet your mom in the army? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was because you know back to that time, my mom was a uh, Mongolian ethnicity, a boy in Tachin, which is uh, uh, on the border of China and Kazakhstan today. But back to then, was Soviet Union, and because the Cultural Revolution that uh, the middle school study was in, interrupted, and uh, we can't go to high school, so my mother also like your mother. Uh, was uh, allocated or sent to the rural areas to, to support their local construction. Zhibian, Shangshan, Xiaxiang, we call it, to go into the mountains and go into rural areas to support the local development because they are Zhi Shi kind of. Uh, so your, your mom is a Mongol, uh, she come from a Mongol yeah. family on the border, yeah. uh, but she's from the kind of the north very northwestern tip of Xinjiang, like near yeah, yeah, the border Tashin. between Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, and Mongolia. That that kind of the tri yeah. little triangle area. Yeah, that 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 was uh, 
uh, yeah, I, I, if I remember correctly, I think Tatsun, the Chinese name Tatsun is like a shortened form of its Mongol name, like uh, Tar Ba Tai or something like that. And uh, yeah, and, yeah, you're very knowledgeable on that. Yeah, yeah. So Just, that, uh, that's like the traditional kind of the, 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 the Mongol um, pasture uh, back in the days. Yeah, yeah. Back in the days. Okay. So, yeah. So, my mother's you... family actually traced back to the royal Mongolian families, the golden families, back to uh, the Genghis Khan time. Uh, oh, wow. And uh, there's a small town, there's a small town just uh, next to Tachun called Urmi. I don't know if you've heard about it. Urmi yeah. was actually the capital of one of the major kingdoms uh, built by uh, Genghis Khan's descendants, uh, Wu Tai. So it's called, in Chinese, it's called Wu Tai Wang Fu Fen Bi. Uh, its capital is in, uh, in Ermi. It's very big. Uh, oh, that's a, so that is a headquarter of the Okdai, the, the son of, Geng, of, yeah, the, yeah. of Genghis Khan. Exactly. Okay, yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 um, I, I like Mongol history and all that. I, I'm a kind of history nerd. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I knew I like. I knew there yeah. was an Ogadai Khanate. There was a, a like the the uh, Genghis Khan allotted a, a piece of land to yeah. his son Ogadai. But then Ogadai became the great Khan later, so he ruled the whole Mongol mm -hmm. Empire. But I never figured out exact location of the Ogadai Khanate. Like where his um where is his fief, his personal fief. So yeah, that thank you for clearing that up for me. Now I realize it's in Northwest Xinjiang. <laughs> I just yeah, very few, very few people know that. So yeah. I remember uh, at one time I saw you posted a, a map of Central Asia uh, throughout history uh, back in the uh, 1500s or something, uh, which clearly marked my mother's hometown, uh, the early next year. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. So, uh, so you you can trace descent to Genghis Khan through your mother's side. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Anyway, because <laughs> uh, Mongols in that area is not many, and not many. It's only a small group of people. So, uh, most of that small group of people can be traced back to that royal family. So, my mother was uh, my mother's member of that family. Perfect. So, uh, this, uh, I, I still remember that my grandmother, my mother said, can speak fluent Mongolian and Kazakh. She was illiterate. She can't write. She couldn't write, but she can speak their fluent language, both language and Han. So it is trilingual. So uh, she was such a typical, uh, you know, Mongol old lady in my memory. Uh, and she, very elegant, very knowledgeable and trilingual. So uh, every time, you know, when we, uh, when I was little, if we want to buy some fresh land, not that kind of frozen land, you know, we go to the land market where the livestock is sold on market back in Wanchi, back in Tachin. So every time we need to remember that, bring our granny, you know, bring the grandma because she can communicate, she can communicate with the local uh, shepherds so well. You know, the most famous shepherd back in Xinjiang, not we were. We were good, very good farmers and uh, merchants, uh, but uh, they're not good at uh, you know, uh, doing the farming, doing the livestock farming. The most famous herd shepherd back in Xinjiang was Kazakh. They produced the highest quantity of beans, land, and so on. So uh, because my grandmother can speak very fluent Kazakh, so every time we got premium beef and lamb with the lowest price. <laughs> so, uh, she she was a really good bargainer, as I would like to say. Yeah. It's so a, almost, that's yeah. a good point because not many people realize that Xinjiang, especially northern Xinjiang, is a very diverse place. It's very uh, multi, yeah. it's multi ethnic and very diverse. Because like people think talk about Xinjiang, they just associate it either with Han or Uyghurs. They didn't realize there's still like. 40 other ethnic groups from Xinjiang, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, like Mongols, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, uh, Tatar, Russian, Tajik, yeah, yeah. uh, and Hui, 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 and Hui Muslim as well. So like, yeah. it's, like even, even mm -hmm. in China, I mean, that's not just like in the West, like the, in the West, the, the knowledge about Xinjiang is like zero. So they just believe whatever the mainstream media tells them. And, and they, they just know Excellent. Xinjiang as, 
or like the the just, just they just know Xinjiang and Uyghur, right? But even in China itself, in like inland China, a lot of people just associate Xinjiang with maybe Uyghur. They they don't they, they don't even realize there's like tons of ethnic groups in Xinjiang. Like the Mongols have been in Xinjiang since you know before the time of Genghis Khan, right? Yeah, for at least eight hundred years. Yes, yeah. that's true. So I agree with you. That's a very good point. That um, Xinjiang was a very special place that not many people, you know, know very well. Even for Chinese, for every Chinese, uh, for example, when I went to Beijing, when I came to Beijing uh, back when I was eighteen for college, many people ask me that, "Well, you're from Xinjiang, so you must be Uyghurs." There are twenty. Come on, there, there's twenty plus more ethnic groups in Xinjiang. And we were, of course, there, there has the largest population, but there's many other more ethnic groups which are native, they, they lived for centuries uh, in Xinjiang. So it's, it's a very diversified in terms of ethnicity and population and religious. So it's, it's not, it's, Xinjiang is not belongs to a single population or a single religion. That's, I think that's the uh, very shallow understanding of Xinjiang. If you, only associated with certain groups of certain religion. So that I think you brought up, you brought up a very good point. So um, yeah, back to my uh, mother family story. It's so interesting. Uh, so basically uh, from my grandma's, from my mother's, uh, you know, grandma on my mother's side, because she's a very knowledgeable and very smart Mongolian lady, she insisted to send her children to high schools instead of from the Mongolian. Uh, ethnicity schools because in Xinjiang there's a, after the 1949 there's two education systems there's an ethnic, ethnic education system there's Han education system so basically uh, because the constitution and the local law uh, confirms the rights of receiving education in your own language if you're ethnic group people so you have to build this two system of uh, education one in Han Mandarin education one in your so uh, let, mm -hmm. let's say emphasize, and I just want to emphasize that for a second, especially yeah. for my American audience, because because uh, because you know I know Americans might think of the two separate schools. I think, oh my God, that's segregation. Uh, yeah, I know segregation. Right? <laughs> and so that's why I need to. So now this is um this is this was created after the creation of People's Republic of China because the that. the ethnic policy of PRC is that in the autonomous regions like Xinjiang is Uyghur yeah. autonomous region and so after five, in, yeah so in Xinjiang by law the the, the yeah. local uh, ethnicity will be entitled to educate be educated in their own language their own so, language. so that is why there's a Uyghur only school but but people have a choice right they can choose whether they go to the Uyghur school or the Han school right Exactly. I think you have touched one of the central problems here in China, which I, I mean to develop a little bit later. Uh, these two are uh, systems of education, which is completely different or the opposite side, on the opposite side of segregation, means that you have the rights to choose which system you go to. So um, uh, from kindergarten, uh, primary school, all the way to high school back in China, I because I went to uh, Han school uh, after my mother, because my mother also went to Han school. And, and when we say Han school, we're actually just talking about Mandarin education school, right? Because Mandarin, like, it's, it's not a school for Han people. It's a, it's a school no, no, where no. the language, educational it's only language. Yeah, the, the yeah. medium, educational medium is in Mandarin Chinese. Yeah. Okay, Mandarin. Let's, let's get that yeah. out of there. Not for <laughs> Han only or ethnic group only. Yeah. No. It's not, it's not can... like if you're Uyghur, you can only go to the Uyghur school. No, it's like the Uyghur school are taught in. Uyghur language, the the the, yeah. the so what what we call the Han school are the Mandarin uh, lang uh, Mandarin language as an educational medium schools, but people can choose exactly. which like the Uyghur okay. can go to the Han school <laughs> and yeah, the yeah. Han can so, go to Uyghur school if they want, but like it's completely yes yeah. yes uh, it's permitted by law and it's your rights to choose which language uh, which language are you uh, of education are you receiving. So, but the uh, practitioner, uh, but the uh, practical problem is that uh, if you are Han, if you want to go to ethnic schools, you have to learn ethnic language, which is uh, you know, very difficult for them. So 
uh, I think most of the time Han people just going to Han schools. And another reason is about social economic empowerment, for example, because if you are the Han schools and you means that you are going to a higher education system, uh, which is uh, has uh, you know uh, the whole uh, China higher Chinese higher education system is open for you, because if you are only because if you are ethnic minorities uh, to who study in ethnic minority language. That means that you have to take the local uh, university intake exam. That means that many Chinese universities, the top universities like Tsinghua, Beida, and Fudan, are not open for you because they can't provide this uh, ethnic minority language courses for you. I so, remember. Uh, so I remember there was a. I watched a documentary from Xinjiang called. Uh, I come from Xinjiang. I from Xinjiang. This is a this is a documentary uh, made by a Uyghur uh, film uh, documentary maker about different people from Xinjiang. And I what stuck out to me is one scene where they interview these uh, Uyghur couples working in a Uyghur restaurant in Beijing, and the the man, uh, the young man, said he graduated from college uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, but it's obvious he, he couldn't speak Mandarin, right? So he mm. uh, he went through the whole Uyghur education system from from kindergarten to college, only be educated in Uyghur. And he one thing he he talked about on the show was um, when he was interviewed, he was speaking Uyghur. He said, you know, he had a lot of problem um, integrating in Beijing because Beijing obviously is a Mandarin speaking environment, and he didn't have the Mandarin skills. So like only option for him, even though he was college educated in back in Xinjiang in the Uyghur college uh, in Beijing, his only kind of job opportunity was working the Uyghur restaurant. Right, that's true. And that's very sad for them. Uh, I, I feel that the uh, same way because uh, uh, you, you're right. If you're only receiving uh, as the minority language education, for example, most of the, as most of the river people did, your job opportunity, job uh, hunting opportunity are very limited if you're not in Xinjiang or when you're other parts of China. So I think that's one of the things that the Chinese government uh, tries to empower them by, uh, you know, by trying to provide uh, as many uh, higher education opportunities to them as possible. But back to the 80s and 90s, when I, uh, when I was growing, there wasn't so, so many opportunities back then that Xinjiang was relatively underdeveloped compared to, to the coastal area. So the education, so the resources uh, for the education are also limited. So we can only stick to our traditional system of high, uh, Mandarin education and ethnic minority language education. So that's one of the reasons. I, I also want to interject just for a second. There is actually a vast difference in educational resources within China. Like if you're from Beijing or Shanghai, you get the best educational resources. Uh, but if you're from like a, 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 a second tier or third tier city, or if you're from a rural countryside, your education resources is a lot limited. And, and if you're from Xinjiang, of course, then, then it's like a, you're like off the chart. You just fall off the chart, right? So there's like kind of almost a hierarchical system. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky I'm from, uh, you know, I was born in a big city in Chongqing, but still even Chongqing compared to um, Beijing and Shanghai, it's not, it's not the same, you know, Beijing and Shanghai is up here. Chongqing is maybe like down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah third tier. So back then, Chongqing is maybe a third tier city. <laughs> back in 1980s, no, yeah. Yeah. Third tier. yeah, you're absolutely uh, right on that. So the education resources, uh, allocation was always a problem uh, when I was uh, you know, back in the 80s and 90s. So the opportunities for the ethnic minority people to receive Mandarin education wasn't, you know, uh, wasn't very good back to that. So, um, yeah, let's uh, get back to my uh, grandma. So uh, she insists that uh, her children should go to high school to receive uh, Mandarin education because uh, he knows that her children can access to a bigger market, whether it's a job market or 
you know, she, you know, oh, she so, so your grandma sent your mother to Han, Han school. She sent all her children to Han school. Mm. So, so, so thanks to my uh, grandmas and my mother's side, you know, so uh, my mother's family actually, uh, you know, actually uh, very good uh, later when they developed. And my cousins are receiving, uh, most of them receiving higher education and they work in the urban area. And so uh, I think, I think. Uh, so let me ask you at this point, uh, you know, for your Han educated, the Mongol yeah. side of the family, did they face any kind of discrimination uh, growing up in Xinjiang? No, I can remember of actually, because uh, we don't, the, the discrimination we understand in China is, um, for example, on two folds. For, first, you look differently and people are not taking you as their, you know, as their pals. I mean, for Mongol, this issue is not very obvious because uh, all the Han Chinese are actually Mongolian ethnicity, you know, in, in terms of anthropology. So I mean, because we, we look the that, same, we, 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 we look, look the there's, same. there's like a not, uh, Mongols are not a, like a visible minority, as we say in yeah, United yeah, States. It's true, yeah, it's, it's true. It's, 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 so like the, the difference may be uh, in like the language and, and, and but, but language. if yeah. you are educated, already in Mandarin Chinese, that kind of removed that additional barrier, I guess. Mm, yeah, that's right. And the second barrier is about the language. If you don't speak the common language and there are some opportunities you cannot access to, there are some, you know, some resources you cannot access to. I think that's the hard truth. So uh, from, uh, my mother, from my mother's generation, we don't have those two issues anymore because my grandma's wise decision of proactively uh, in, integrated our family into the Han education system and into the Mandarin education system. So uh, I think that's the reason we can enjoy all the ethnic minority groups uh, benefits provided by the government too. So, um, so my mother actually uh, uh, went from Tachun, let's come back to Tachun, and to Turpan as a, as a, as a uh, because she uh, just finished her middle school back to Zen. So that's where she met my father at so She was an educated yeah. youth sent down to the countryside. <laughs> down oh, to oh, the countryside. I, this is for my English, English speaking <laughs> audience. I'm just translating. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, back, to the, back to that time in the early, late 60s and early 70s, I think you're probably aware of that. Most of the Chinese girls, uh, no matter of ethnicities, I, I think, uh, most of the ethnicities, uh, their dreams are married to uh, state-owned factory workers. Uh, what is even better is to marry to a PLA, you know, soldier or officer, because uh, back to the socialist the plant economy, that was, <laughs> that was the jobs that was guaranteed the resources, you know, allocated to the households. So that was the, it's that a very, the, very, uh, it's a very yeah. practical choice, but also very back, in, back in the Cultural Revolution era, PLA also has a lot of command of very high prestige. Like it's not just yeah. monetary, it's not just a material con condition, but also uh, PLA social has a, like a very high social standing. Like you, you, it's like if you're from a soldier family, if you're part PLA, like people up, look up to you as well as all the associated benefits. And and a full disclaimer, my mom's first boyfriend is a PLA yeah. soldier, but but she was he was um he so during Cultural Revolution. Uh, you know, during that time, they the 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 army has to approve your marriage. So uh, like, yeah. she and her boyfriend, they send a pro, like uh, they send in the request for getting married, but that was um, rejected because uh, her boyfriend was uh, was on her boyfriend was on the track to be promoted to be an officer to be like she he was on the track of going places, but my mom was from. Um, because my my grandpa on my my mother's side, he had some KNT association from back in the day. So, so my mom was like the bad class element, you know, because her family background. So the army didn't approve. Yeah, yeah. You know, he he's a hey, blame, <laughs> the, the, the 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 black five uh, five elements. So my 
So the army rejected their, their marriage uh, request. And that's how I, my mom then met, met my dad. That's how I come from. So, so well, lucky you. for yeah, you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, that was the, I think that was the characteristic uh, of that time, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, around cultural revolution of how, uh, you know, people are seeking their spouse, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, based on some very practical reasons. Yeah. Um, Right, that's that's that answers to your, your questions as per the need the meeting uh, the Matin Turpin. And, Did your mom uh, speak? Uh, do your mom yeah. use, uh, Do your mom speak, speak Mongolian? Uh, she can. Uh, she can understand Mongolian mm. most of the time, but she can't speak very well mm. because uh, uh, if you go to high school and yeah. you receive education in high school, you only speak to your mother and father from time to time Mongolian. And you don't tend to use them. Too that's much. that's kind of so, like the that's actually kind of like a lot of the Chinese American family I know in the United States. The the kids they understand Chinese when they're being spoken to by their parents, but because the, because their ways are socialized in school, they speak only English. So when they come back, yeah. the parents will speak to them in Chinese, but they will respond in English. So yeah, that, that's that's very common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I found it's very similar with the second second generation of immigrations, uh, yeah. Chinese immigrations in the West. When I was uh, studying and working overseas, so yeah. um, yeah, that's where they meet in Terpen, and then uh, uh, they moved to Romchi, and uh, my sister was born in Terpen, Terpen, and I was born in Romchi. That's so. That's how. This family is made of. Oh, so you 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 have an older sister. Your your sister is older than. I had an older sister. Oh, so I'm you're the like second child. Okay, yeah, you're like me, and second then, child. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. my yeah. uh, so you you basically travel when you're growing up. You basically travel all over Xinjiang. You know, you or or your family did from you know, especially your mom from Tatsun all the way on the border from Kazakhstan <laughs> to Turpan, the Turpan. all the way on the eastern part of Xinjiang, and then they yeah. settle in Urumqi, which is in the center of Xinjiang. Okay, wow. Yeah, okay. north. Yeah, on the north center of Xinjiang, exactly. So that's the basically the story of uh, uh, of my of my family, and uh, there's some other things. Interesting thing is, uh, you know, my my mother's family was not only made of Mongolian ethnicity; it was also Kazakh and Russian. So it's a very mixed family. So my mom's uncle uh, is actually Kazakh, uh, and she married a Kazakh woman. And their their kids are all Kazakh ethnicities, and one thing particularly interesting about the, my mother's uncle was that they, <laughs> they defected to the Soviet Union back in the sixties. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. So this country. was uh, for the people of uh, who are not yeah. familiar with this part of Chinese history. Yeah. So after the site, so Soviet Union used to have a like a large influence on Xinjiang up to the point do? of the Sino-Soviet split, right? So after yeah. the Sino-Soviet split, the relationship broke up. And then uh, this was also, also around the time in 19, early 1960s when uh, Soviet Union, uh, under Khrushchev, uh, Soviet Union yeah. was trying to develop Central Asia. They're trying to invite a lot of settlers to what they call the virgin lands in Kazakhstan to, to, yeah. to farm. And, and one of the solution they, they found was uh, the Soviet consulate in uh, Yinin or Kuja started to Actually, hand out passport to, yeah. <laughs> to whoever come asking. Like uh, this, is, this is in China, in Xinjiang, the Soviet consulate in Xinjiang was handing out, freely handing out Soviet passport to anybody yeah. who want one. So uh, yeah, yeah. That, then in 1960s too, I think that, uh, it, it became known as the Yinin incident when like 60,000, more than 60,000 people more than from, 60, yeah. from, from the Yili Valley, they were all went across the border to, yeah. to Kazakhstan. So your, your uncle was one of the, among one of the way. My whole, my uncle's family was one of them. Yeah. Oh, wow. So we called, uh, that was, I think that was in 1963, we called it Ita Shijian, where uh, the incident of uh, Yili and Tachin where uh, more than 60, yeah, 60 thousands of uh, uh, peoples live on the border of China in the USSR actually went over to USSR, become USSR citizen. And back to that time, 
in the early 60s uh, was the honeymoon time between China and South Korea. Uh, the border was practically, uh, no one controls the border. So the people on the border from both sides can just uh, cross the border freely. And after the 1962 uh, uh, ETA incident, uh, the border was closed. And, uh, I remember, I remember a lot of reading a lot of memoirs about, you know, the, the time of Sino-Soviet split that before yeah. in 1950s and before the Sino-Soviet split, the whole frontier, whole front northern frontier with Mongolia, with Soviet Union, it's all unguarded. You know, like they talk about fishermen on the Amur River, on Heilongjiang, they would just freely cross over to fish and the, yeah. the Russian, they, sometimes they meet the Russian patrol and they, they wave at them. And the, but that, yeah. that, that all changed after the Sino-Soviet split, yeah. Yeah, after 1962, that's true. And yeah, and uh, that's the story of my uh, mother's uncle. And, and this is your, of, this is your, so th your, this is your mother's uncle. So he's Mong, he's a Mongol that married a Kazakh woman, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. No, he, no, my, how, my uncle was half Mongol and half Kazakh himself. I think. Oh, oh, he's yeah. half Kazakh, half Mongol. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the people and don't she, real, people don't realize how diverse and how oh, intercultural, yeah. multicultural the area of Tatsun and Yinin are. Like this is area of northwestern Xinjiang. Uh, you know the 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 traditionally calls three district. That's so, so the 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 Yinin is in the Yili Valley and Tatsun is a little bit in the north. So that yes. whole Atai. Yeah. Atai is the northernmost point. Oh right. So Atai. So, uh, yeah. uh, uh, the Altai, the Tatsun, and um, and and mm -hmm. Yili, they're, they're the three three districts, the three three and they're like right on the border with former Soviet Union and Mongolia, and th that area has a lot of influence from like Russia and the Soviet Union, and there was a lot of um, yeah, there's a lot of mixtures on on this border. I I I remember reading about that, but you your personal story just kind of flesh out the, all the details. So thank you for that. That really happens to my family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, when I heard this story, it's, oh wow, this could be a TV series or drama or drama or something. <laughs> yeah, but that's the real story happened to my family. So my mother uh, told me when I was young that. Uh, they, they knew nothing. They lived not far from with each other, I mean, my mother's family and her uncle's family, not far from each other on the same street. But almost over one night, suddenly they disappeared. And no one knows where they did they go. So they just guessed that they might cross the border with the help of KGB and the Soviet consulate in Tachin and become a Soviet Union citizen. And they, since then, they lost contact with each other for almost 40 years until 1992, after the collapse of Soviet Union. Suddenly, one day, uh, my mom and my uncle, my mom's uh, younger brother, received a letter or a phone call, I can't remember, from, uh, uh, from Almaty, the capital of Kazakhstan back then, and says that we have uh, they have found their uncle wow. after 40 years. Uh, they have already grown into a very big family, and their children married to Kazakh, Russians, and uh, uh, different ethnicities. And uh, last time I saw my uh, mother's uncle's family, He's, uh, he already passed away, uh, but uh, he has about three sons and two daughters and something, and they have their kids, so they're a big family. So four of my uh, cousins, they're all females, came over to visit us uh, back to 2004, I think. That was quite an experience because the four girls all looked different too. One blonde, one black hair, one red <laughs> you know? And I can't even remember the, the last one. It's, it's brown hair, I think, it's brown hair girl. So they're all my cousins. And they only speak Russian and a little English and a little Kazakh. So we can only communicate with each other with English. And, you know, uh, so I, I, I guess I never had the opportunity to ask my uncle whether we regret the decision of uh, mm. defected to the Soviet Union back to the 60s. But I guess we never thought the Soviet Union would collapse, the former Soviet Union would collapse in the early, early, early 1990s. So, 
yeah, that was the was the history of my film. Yeah, no, nobody expected Soviet Union will collapse. Not even the CIA. CIA didn't know no. the Soviet Union will collapse. Um, wow, I mean that that is a quite story. I mean, like, but that that that's that whole story of Xinjiang. Uh, you know, kind of being the crossroad and the multicultural melting pot that that goes all the way back. Uh, I mean, like there was a, a back in the 16th, 17th century, there was a, the, the Mongol uh, 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 Torhut tribe that came mm. came back all the Probably, way from yeah. Volga River, right, from Russia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. back to Xinjiang. Yeah. Do, do you do you happen to know your grandma's uh, tribal association? Like, which uh, which Mongol um, Mongol tribe? Uh, I'm not sure. I have to ask my uh, my mother's okay, families okay. Uh, if they have if they know any aware of that. But I'm sure it's not connected to the the, the part you talk about the Tohut because they moved back from uh, from you know the Russian part of the Central Asia back to back to Xinjiang. But my yeah. mother's family has been you know uh, living and touching around that area. For centuries, yeah. so uh, I guess these different branches of the of the Mongol families. So anyway, so that's the that's the my story of my mother's uncle, and for my mother, and uh, she always told me that uh, when she was young, after the nineteen sixty two incident, there was an even serious, even more serious incident in nineteen sixty nine, which a whole uh, a, a whole uh, uh, platoon of PLA. Uh, border troop, border patrol was ambushed by the Soviet army, by the Soviet Red Army, not far from Tashkent. We call it uh, the incident, the uh, incident. Uh, the it's it's mainly uh, 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 retaliation on the PLA's action in the Dongbei, in the north uh, northeastern of China, in Zhenbaodao, the Treasure Island, because the Treasure Island, the PLA got an upper hand, and they even captured a T to a. a, a the most advanced uh, Soviet tanks by that time. So I T think it was a T-72, maybe like the T-62. Yeah, T-62 62. tank was captured by the PLA. PLA. So this yeah, is yeah. Uh, what the, the, the what Chinese called the Zhenbaodao was uh, called uh, known by Russian as a Damansky, Damansky Island. Yeah, yeah. And this was a yeah. 1969 uh, incident where um, like even even U U.S. even the Western press were aware of it because it's it's like a very major military confrontation between China and yeah. Soviet Union on the on the Amur River along the Amur, Amur River. River. Yeah, and and yeah. and so 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 Soviet wanted a payback for yeah for that. So they staged an incident right near Xinjiang on the other side of the China Soviet border, yeah. and and this is the incident you're talking about. Yeah, uh, because uh, the incident happened, it's very close to my mother's hometown. Uh, so she remembers that after that incident, because she was in middle school, the school basically shut down and nobody taught lessons or, or studying. The things they do all day is just digging bunkers and underground tunnels to, pre to prepare for nuclear warfare exchange to, to prepare for total war with Soviet Union. So I think she did that for months. <laughs> I think that that's was, uh, that was her childhood. I'm really sometimes really sorry for her, but that was the situation back then. She got faces, uh, the superpowers you know, with nuclear powers. It, 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 um, wasn't, it so. wasn't just uh, your mom because I live in Chongqing. That's as far from the Soviet border Shen, as possible. The third frontier, yeah. Yeah, but, but back still, then, yeah, 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 back yeah. Back then in, in, in Cultural Revolution, they dug tunnels underneath the mountains of Chongqing. Like now you can go to Chongqing. There's like all kind of underground tunnels. Like they build like yeah, yeah. shopping malls in, in those underground tunnels. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Like, but yeah, that, yeah. That, that was also yeah. to prepare for the possible war between China and Soviet Union. And that, that was right. because Chongqing was maybe like, as you said, the third, the third front, that, that's going to be the, the last the resort. Third. If it's a Soviet Union that's occupied right. the Northern China, you know, the <laughs> so, we were at first front. We were at first front. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you guys are like right up there. You, you guys are right the you, you, you'll be the meeting yeah. the first wave of the Red Army coming over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, my mother and her 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 classmates will be run over by solar tanks in five minutes after the war broke out or something like that. Yeah, I also remember. Well, yeah. you weren't born back then, but like in 1979, during the uh, in the Chi China Vietnamese uh, uh, China Vietnamese border war in 1979, yeah, I remember. Uh, uh, you know, China put on all the northern frontier with Soviet Union on high alert. Like there were like. Uh, 300,000 people were evacuated um, from the frontier. Uh, yeah. I, 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 you, you, you weren't born yet, so you, you might not know, but your mom might know about that. Yeah, yeah. Back to then, they're already, I think they're, they're already in Guangxi, but yes, because uh, the Vietnam, the, uh, the Chinese government was, uh, military was afraid of that, that the Soviet Union might be taken advantage from the north side when uh, the PLA engaged with the Vietnam army on the, on the south side. So yeah, that was, that was the time. So Xinjiang was uh, facing very, uh, I would say very um, serious geopolitical situation multiple times in history. So uh, if you ask me, well, well, today, how do you think today's Western you know, propaganda and Western you know, uh, things on Xinjiang about the genocide concentration camps, I think, well, personally, I think that it's nothing compared to what my mother experienced back to that time, the Soviet tanks, you know, about 200 meters away from you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's only a meter Yeah, I that, mean, so. I, let's ju I just put it out there. There's no genocide in Xinjiang, okay? Yeah. That's, that's, that's all bullshit. And if anybody who is aware of the Xinjiang history, you know, I, I'm a history nerd, so I read about the Xinjiang history from... 17th from the 17th century all the way up to the present and what i can say is you know no matter what you think the prc policy in xinjiang is after 1949 um especially after 1976 and after the end of cultural revolution xinjiang has never enjoyed more uh you know, Xinjiang has never been more at peace <laughs> and stable because because back in whole, the whole early 20th century of Xinjiang is just civil war, like nonstop civil war in 1930s, 1940s. I mean, like like there, there were massacres, there, there were massive death, starvation. So so right now in Xinjiang is actually the best time in the last couple hundred years, I would say. Social economically, yes, I agree with you. So, um, yeah, uh, that was the, uh, so that, that's why I, I think it's nothing compared to what my mother experienced because they uh, feel the intimidation of the real nuclear war, but now it's just a propaganda and fake news and disinformation, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, sure. Uh, that, so that's the story of my mother's family, which I always find interesting. So, um, talking about myself, so uh, after I was born, the second child of the family, thanks to the ethnic minority policies that were immune from the one child policy myself. So um, another thing is that life changing experiences at uh, Gaokao, the uh, University of Utah. Because uh, I also went to this school. So, so, so but before, before you start talking about the college yeah. interest exam, um, so you have a choice, right? Like when you, when your dad, your parents register you on your uh, I know, they, they have a choice to register you either as Han or Mongol, right? Yes, as long as uh, your parents actually are Han and Mongol, so yeah. the children can choose either. So why not choose Mongol? <laughs> so so uh, that's why I'm uh, registered as a Mongol and uh, go to high school as well. So uh, I, I have to say that probably many of my uh, to fellow strategies that we don't have to go to one place as myself because they are as ethnic minorities, they go to ethnic language schools. So we can, we only can follow the path of ethnic language education forward. So you can't actually redeem, obviously, the benefits uh, for the ethnic minorities like the vulture. You need to redeem that culture at some point. So how to redeem that culture? But if you're ethnic minority, if you go to high school, let's join the University of Utah examination as an ethnic but you, you answer the questions and you answer the typical exam with Han, Chinese, with Mandarin. 
that's the time you need to use blockchain because this policy is designed to uh, logic behind this policy is that as the, as the minority people, you are um, you have certain disadvantages, language, the narrative, other things. So in order to close the gap between between you and other to empower them. So we have bonus points for for example. You get either 10 or 50 bonus points uh, as an SDM that taking time Chinese examinations to go to, go to Chinese universities uh, to study Chinese and teach. So, uh, do you know the differences between 10 points and 50 points? What's that difference? Uh, so, let me, I, I, I want to, so we, we have some uh, little bit technical issue because. Like for some, like yeah, yeah. your right, sound right. is coming through not very, uh, like it's a very low value. But I, I'm gonna uh, 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 put a personal anecdote also about the about the uh, Chinese affirmative action um, and and the uh, and the ethnic policy. So my uh, growing up in Chongqing, we don't have a lot of minorities. <laughs> like, you know, so, so Chongqing, Chongqing is like 99% Han Chinese. Um, so I, I was not even aware there was like uh, ethnic minority in my school until, um, so what, one of my best friend turned out to be a Hui Muslim, but I didn't know, I didn't know he's a Hui Muslim until the, until the, yeah, until the, uh, um, because not only there's college English exam, but there's also exam for uh, from elementary school to junior high and from junior high to high school. So uh, during the exam from elementary school to junior high, his brother, his older brother, um, uh, his older brother is in the same class as my, my sister. Uh, and so she, she, yeah, he, people find out he put on Hui, you know, Hui Muslim on, on his uh, on his floor, so he can get the extra extra uh, bonus point on his uh, on his exam. And people at the time, people thought it was oh, it's so unfair. But it, his brother is actually one of the you know the he's among the top five student in his class. Um, but I guess the difference is 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 like like being top five. He was guaranteed get into like any uh, high school that's maybe the second rank. Like at the time, the Chongqing uh, uh, during our district, Sapinba district in Chongqing, the the best two schools is uh, the the Yizong and Sanzong, the number one and number three uh, schools or the uh, high schools were the best. And then the uh, Qizong is is. It's kind of maybe a little bit less, right? The, the number seven, number seven school is a little bit less. So he has no problem, like being number, uh, like on top five of his class. He has no problem getting into, you know, number seven at junior high. <laughs> like, but but that extra, you know, whatever extra points he get from Hui Mus, uh, being Hui Muslim, just guarantee him a spot at the top, you know, like a top school. So so yeah, I remember that, and I, that I should have realized, like. Because he he was younger, my my friend is younger than me, and I did not have anybody in my class that had a sibling, right? Like, why did he have an older brother? I mean, that should have clued me in. Like, he, his family is ethnic minority, but it didn't connect to me at the time. But yeah, he he was a Hui Muslim, and uh, but his dad, so his 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 um his grandparents uh were from Yunnan, right? Like very traditional. Of a very traditional Muslim um, area, but but his dad was uh, very secular, like because this is like 1980s, right? It's a very secular time. So his dad was <laughs> like we don't didn't realize his dad is Muslim because his dad is like every live there like everybody else. He didn't pray. He didn't he didn't like you know go to mosque. He didn't so so nobody knows. Very you know? secular. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, so like, we only find out when his son filling a form in the in the uh, application to junior high. Yeah, that that was right. my anecdote. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, that's when you find the ethnic minority guys around you, you know, <laughs> like filling the forms and get yeah. the points. That's true. That's happened to me. So basically, I you know, I think most of your audiences are in this China Scout Council. 
how is uh, you know, life changing opportunities and what stuff which happens to groups and teachers what kind of universities in the country all of hardly largely you know determines who are left kids especially like the politics so the the full points of uh, which is Sorry, the university intake exam is about 750. So, most of the kids, if you can do 600, you're very good, you're exceptionally good. Gordon, can you, you hold can out you? One, one second? I'm going to try yeah, to sure. fix the audio problem. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop uh, this meeting and I'm going to start a new one. Hopefully, that will fix the. Uh, uh, because right yeah, now, sure. your video is coming. Your video feed is coming through very clear, but your audio, I can, I have, I'm in, ha having trouble hearing you. So let me stop yeah, yeah, sure. and, and restart. So we have this part of the video. Uh, let me yeah. start recording.